Let's read together from verse 12. 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, in fact, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Now, Paul reminded us in verses 1 to 11, we saw that last time, that believe, that the believers in Corinth already believed in Christ's resurrection. Otherwise, they would not have been saved. They knew Jesus was raised from the dead and they believed in that. And if they already believed that, the question comes up, why this very strong affirmation of the reality of the resurrection then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Well, the answer is, they were, they believed in Christ's resurrection, but they were confused about their own resurrection from the dead. And the Lord's resurrection formed the basis, you must see here, for Paul's double-edged sword here, his double-edged argument here about the re resurrection. And it goes something like this. Because Christ was raised, resurrection from the dead is obviously possible. But on the other hand, if people in general can't be resurrected, because it seems to be a, have been a problem in, in Corinth, Christ could not have been raised from the dead either. The two resurrections stand and fall together. And he says, there could not be one without the other. And the further implication is that if there is no resurrection from the dead, the gospel message we believe and preach is meaningless and useless, worthless. Now, it seems strange to us that some of those believers accepted one part of the truth without the other. And the cause of this confusion, as with many of their other problems in Corinth, was because of the continuing influence of the pagan philosophies and religions many of them had before they were saved. Those situations they were saved from. Just like in our day the philosophical and the spiritual and the cultural thinking uh, had many erroneous and false ideas about what happens to people after they die. And we're all influenced by that. No matter which culture we come from, we are all influenced by that. Some people teach us, or some teach us, soul sleep. You may have heard about that. And what they mean by that is that the body dies and disintegrates while the soul or the spirit rests. Materialists believe in utter extinction, total annihilation. Nothing survives after death, they say. Death ends it all. Whatever was there is no more. Some religions teach reincarnation where the soul or the spirit is continually recycled, if you like, from one form to another, even from human to animal or from animal to human. Others believe in what is generally described as absorption, 
where the spirit, or at least part of the spirit, returns to its source and is absorbed back into the ultimate divine mind or being. And someone described it like this. They said, uh, would it really matter if we were lost like a drop of water in the ocean? If I could be one shiny particle in some glorious wave that broke in utter splendor, in perfect beauty, on the shores of some eternal sea. You may have heard something like that. The problem with all those views is that human personhood and individuality are thought to be lost forever at death. Whatever, if anything, if anything survives, it's no longer a person, no longer an individual, and no longer a unique being. Now, in the ancient world, Paul's time, uh, that's Paul's time, generally believed in the immortality of the soul that they believe, but they strongly oppose the idea of a resurrection body. The body was considered evil, while the spirit was considered pure in their minds. And therefore we, we must be stripped of the flesh, the body, and the spirit inside will be pure and free, and that happens at death. But that was totally false. Humans are complete beings. We can't be divided up into segments in that sense. If the body is sinful, so are our spirits. And when God saves us, He saves us completely. Body, mind and spirit. The whole being, if you like. In Christ, our whole being is declared righteous by God forever. But as Paul had experienced when he preached at, at the Areopagus, that was in Athens, in Greece, 2,000 years ago, this is not what many people wanted to believe in those days. Acts 17 verse 32 records, when they, that was the Athenian philosophers, heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. It's possible that even some of the Jewish members of the Corinthian church doubted the resurrection. Even though the resurrection is taught in the Old Testament, some Jews, some sect of the Jewish faith, like the Sadducees, did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. That is why they were so sad, you see. <laughs> the Sadducees. That is an old joke. It was very funny when we were at the Rosebank Bible College. That was often used. If you don't believe in the resurrection, that's why you're so sad, you see. Uh, in the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel's prediction in Daniel 12 verse 2 of the resurrection is very clear. That is the resurrection of the lost as well as of the saved. He says, multitudes asleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, Others to shame and everlasting contempt. And in the New Testament teaching about the resurrection, it's also abundantly clear. In fact, Jesus almost used Daniel's words, word for word, when he preached. Yes, it seems like the Gospels... Oh, uh, were not written when Paul wrote this letter, but we must understand that when Paul, by the time Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, the Gospels weren't written yet. But at the time, Jesus' life was well known, and the believers in Corinth learned about the Lord's teaching from Paul and Peter and others. Truths like John 6 verse 44, 
No one can come to me unless the Father who sent, sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. We're known by those people. And John 11 verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Who he who believes in me will live even though he dies. They were well known in those days. The whole foundation of the apostolic teaching was that Christ rose from the dead and that all who believed in him would be raised. Remember Peter and John preaching in Jerusalem soon after Pentecost. Acts 4, 1 and 2. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people and they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And not long before he wrote this letter to the Corinthians, Paul penned these words to the believers in Thessalonica. You remember, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. He said to them, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we are still alive and are left. will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. But although the resurrection of believers was taught in the Old Testament and by Jesus during his earthly ministry and by the apostles, serious doubts had infected many Corinthian Christians. And it's those doubts that Paul now so forcefully counters in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And his argument is very simple and logical. Verse 11. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? What Paul is saying here is that if it is true that Christ was raised from the dead, as you know it was, you believe that, and that is why you were saved, how can some of you say there is no resurrection full stop? Obviously referring to the rest of humanity and to believers. That is illogical, says Paul. It's nonsensical. If Christ has been raised, the resurrection obviously is possible for all people. And now in verses 13 to 19, Paul shows us that the resurrection is not only possible, but essential to our faith. And he gives seven disastrous consequences for us if there were no resurrection from the dead. First one, if there were no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Verse 13. And the first most obvious consequences of there being no resurrection would be that not even Christ was raised, my brother and sister. As anyone should easily deduce, Paul argues, no, Paul argues, sorry, if the dead cannot rise, Christ did not rise either. Remember the gospel accounts of Jesus' earthly ministry are of a person who was completely human. He was born to a human mother. He ate and drank and slept and became tired. He wept. He was crucified. He was stabbed. He bled. And he really died on the cross. And when he first appeared to the twelve disciples after his death and his resurrection, Jesus made sure that the disciples touched him to prove that he was not simply a spirit. Because that was also in the thinking of the people there, that maybe he wasn't really human and he was just like a ghost. Luke 29 verse 39 records Jesus saying, Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. 
And then he asked them for something to eat in verse 42. And it says there, they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. In his opening words to the believers in Rome, Paul makes it clear that the gospel of God he was set apart for regarding his son who was as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So here we have it. Jesus' resurrection is evidence of both his humanity and his deity. So the Christians could never fall back on some pagan idea that Christ only appeared to be human and so conclude that his resurrection was not real and therefore no one else will be raised from the dead. He was fully human. He physically lived, died and lived again. So if there's no such a thing as a physical resurrection from the dead, not even Christ has been raised, you see. And it was all a lie. Another consequence, is, uh, another consequence sorry, of, being, uh, of there being no resurrection would be that the preaching of the gospel would be useless and completely meaningless. Verse 14. Uh, in fact, says that in verses 3 and 4, Paul had just said, the heart of the gospel is Christ's death and resurrection for us. He said it there, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. You see, and apart from the resurrection, Jesus would not have conquered sin or death or hell. In fact, those three ultimate evils would be our conquerors forever. We would be slaves to sin and death and hell forever. Or maybe put differently, without the resurrection, the good news would be bad news. And there would be nothing worth preaching about. Without the resurrection, the gospel would be an empty, hopeless message of meaningless nonsense. <coughs> Unless our Lord conquered sin and death and made a way for people to follow him in that victory, there would be no good news to, be, to proclaim, you see. <coughs> so, thirdly, just as no resurrection would make preaching Christ meaningless, it would also make our faith in him useless. Verses 14 and 17, you can pick it up in those verses. Faith in a gospel like that would be empty and fruitless and of no purpose whatsoever. Why not? A dead saviour can't give life, let alone save anyone. If there was no resurrection, there's no salvation. If the dead don't rise, Christ did not rise and we will not rise either. Then we should say with the psalm writer in Psalm 73, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. And in vain I have washed my hands in innocence for nothing. And if there were no resurrection, think about this. All those years of faith mentioned in Hebrews 11 would have believed and persevered for nothing. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Rahab, David, the prophets... All the others would have trusted God for nothing. They would have been mocked and scourged and imprisoned and stoned and afflicted and ill-treated 
and put to death in vain. And all believers of all ages would have believed for nothing, lived for nothing, and in the end died for nothing, my brother and sister. Fourthly, Paul continues in verse 15 and he says, More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. If there's no such thing as a resurrection from the dead, then every person who claimed to have seen the risen Christ and every person who preached the risen Christ is a liar including Paul and the other apostles. They would be false witnesses claiming to be from God, testifying falsely about God and that he raised Christ. To deny the resurrection is to say that the apostles and every other New Testament church leader was not just simply mistaken, as some liberals would have it, but that they were willfully lying. Think about this a bit. If the apostles and the prophets and the New Testament writers lied about the heart of the gospel, why should they believe or why should they believe anything else that those guys said? Why should their moral teachings be considered inspired and good as the liberals do? If they so blatantly falsified their teaching about Christ and his resurrection? The truth is that all New Testament truth stands or falls together based on the resurrection from the dead. And not only that, those witnesses would have testified about and preached and taught a lie. They were maligned and beaten and imprisoned and often martyred for. And let me tell you, self-sacrifice like that is not the stuff frauds and fakes are made of. Normally when it gets hot, the frauds and the fakes come out. And believe me, people don't die to preserve a lie. No. Firstly, here is another serious consequence if there is no resurrection from the dead. Verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. The truth is, if there is no resurrection, the believers would be no better off than unbelievers. You would still be in your sin like the unbelieving world. In line for judgment and condemnation and eternal destruction. Just like the wicked. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then sin won the final victory over Christ. And therefore continues to be victorious over all people. If Jesus remained dead, then we die. When we die, we too will remain dead. And condemned. Romans 6 verse 23 says it clearly. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And if we stay in our sin, then death and eternal punishment are the only prospects for the believer and the unbeliever alike. The whole purpose of trusting in Christ is to have our sins forgiven. Because we need to be saved from our sin. And if Christ was not raised, his death was for nothing. Our faith in him is in vain. And our sins are still counted against us. Then we are still dead in our transgressions and sins. And will be so forever. So my flock, if Christ was not raised from the dead at that time, he did not bring about forgiveness of sin, or salvation, or reconciliation to God, either for now or for all eternity. But God did raise Jesus from the dead. 
Romans 4 verse 25 who was delivered over to death Jesus for our sins and was raised to life for our justification hallelujah that is true that is the point here we stand or fall on Jesus Christ alone his death his life and his resurrection as Jesus said himself because I live you also live <clears throat> then of course according to verse 18 another devastating consequence if there was no resurrection would have been that those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost that's what Paul says there and the idea of falling asleep here does not refer to soul sleep here but simply to death it, uh, falling asleep was a euphemism they used in those days a softening of the term death but Paul is saying is that if there is no resurrection every Old Testament saint, every New Testament Christian who died would have perished and be lost forever and obviously the same would apply to every believer who has died. Since Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. That would be Paul himself. And the other apostles. Augustine. Calvin. Luther. Wesley. Whitfield. Carey. Charles Spurgeon. D.L. Moody. The whole lot. Every other believer of every age would spend eternity in torment without God. And without hope. People you knew who believed. People from your own family. People from our local church. Their faith would have been for nothing. Their sins would have been unforgiven. And their destiny would have been eternal damnation. Now considering all these dev devastating consequences, the last one is rather obvious. Look there for yourself, verse 19. If for this life, or if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all people. Indeed, without the resurrection and the salvation and the blessings it brings, Christianity would be pointless and foolish and pitiable and a miserable business. Without the resurrection, we would have no saviour, no forgiveness, no gospel, no meaningful faith, no life, no hope or any of those things. If only for this life we have hope in Christ. if only for this life we have hope in Christ, would be to teach and preach and suffer and sacrifice and work for nothing. If Christ is still dead, he can't help us with the life to come. And he most certainly can't help us now. Uh -uh. If he can't give us eternal life, he can't improve our earthly life either. If he's not alive, they would be, where would our source of peace and joy and satisfaction be? The Christian life would be a tragic joke and a mockery. A, a Christian has no saviour but Christ. No redeemer but Jesus Christ. And no Lord but Jesus Christ. Therefore, if Christ was not raised... He's not alive. Our Christian life is useless. We would have nothing to justify our faith with. Our Bible study and our preaching and our witnessing and our, our service for him or our worship for him, of, of him, our, our hope either for this life and for the next would be completely unreasonable and unjustified. We would deserve nothing but the pity reserved for fools. But we are not to be pitied, my brother and sister. For Paul immediately continues in verse 20. 
and he proclaims, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. He's gone ahead of us. He was the first one. His, his resurrection was like the promise. His power overcame death. And all those who trust in him will most certainly be saved forever and never be lost. So as we close this morning, and I would ask Carol to come forward and get ready on the, on the keyboard there. Let us be very serious. Get intensely joyful as we sing our closing song today. We sung it before a few times. Christ, genuinely our hope in life and in death. Christ, our hope in life and death. His death and his resurrection. It's essential. And if you don't know this Lord Jesus Christ yet, if you haven't bow, bowed the knee to him yet, if you haven't come to him and confessed your sin and your absolute need of him and his work he's done for you, come, come this morning, come. And you will be saved. And he, the promise is that because he lives, you will also live forever with a glorified body, spirit, and soul.